everybody. Welcome to another video. A hundred dollars later, I just installed Dorico version 6.0. I have been a long time Dorico user coming actually from Sibelius. So I never used Finale. I didn't like their setup layout and workflow. And I was very happy when Sibelius came out first, but then when they sold it to Avid, you know, things have changed a little bit and uh, I, you know, wasn't as happy as before and I switched to Doico and I'm also a Cubase user so I thought hey this uh, sounds actually quite interesting stick within the family and now here we are Dorico version 6.0 and I'm I'm a I like Dorico great things about the program I've done all my typesetting my engraving there for my uh, scores I publish and sell and also for performances so so what is different uh on the right side I uploaded version 5 this is the hub so if the first time you start the program you get the hub and you can see on the right side is 5 on the left side is version 6 and they changed the look a little bit uh, in the old days you would have again your most recent projects were on this on this page and this one see had the blue circle around them when you selected them you see the score name up top uh, date of the last time you worked on it down here on the bottom now they made this gray, there's no box around it, it's just a bluish line on the bottom. A title and date are now on the bottom left. One thing is different, there's a little magnifying glass, so if you hit that, it's going to zoom in a tiny bit and you can see the front page of your score. Maybe helpful if you have a lot of different projects and you keep forgetting what's going on, so you can actually quickly take a look and maybe you know, okay, this is the one I want to continue. So maybe that's the idea behind this. Also, you can see the buttons are larger. The menu also, there's a little more space up here, a tiny bit more than on this side. So they increase the, um, the menu font size. That's good, comes in handy. For I have a high resolution monitor, so it looks good. I can really read everything. Uh, the buttons seem to be really big now. Uh, anyway, uh, they added one more, which is similar to the hub in Cubase. So they explain to you the changes, you know, that's great. For me, the most interesting feature is the proofreading, because as you know, working on a score of especially orchestral music and with a lot of dynamics and instrument changes, transposition, meter changes, whatever, you might overlook something because it's just too much going on on the screen and we've all done the proofreading. So let's see what this thing does actually. So I want to open this composition. Let's open first, let's open both. I'm going to open version 60. It's going to convert to from 5180 to 60. 60, excuse me. That's it. Let's go back to this flow. I just want to have them side by side so I can see. Okay. So again, so now we can see in general, it looks pretty similar. I just noticed again, the font sizes on the menu are larger in version 6. See here they are tighter, smaller. The rest looks all the same. I don't see any font difference, nothing really on this side. Uh, on the top, yes, this button has changed. We get to that. The view button is added. This side pretty much looks the same. There's a new function here. This could be the cycle marker. I will find out, but that one is new. And of course, in the menu, if you look, here we have it. Down here is your proofreader. Okay, so let's see what that did. So let's take a look at uh, what's going on here. So this is a chamber piece, and I'm very detailed when I write concert music, as you can see, uh, going going along. I have, you know, a lot of dynamics, hairpins, you know, things like that, what's going on. Uh, so I like to give musicians uh, instructions <laughs> and helping, helping them to understand my music. Again, they don't know this piece, right? If it's a premiere. So I'm adding a lot of things. So let's see. It looks like already um, down here, you see the bright red 33 errors, not errors or suggestions or something I overlooked. So if you click that box, it opens up the uh, a menu here. Let's go in a little bit. And you can see up here, uh, it tells you, first of all, the categories. You can select what the machine, the AI wants to look at. Clefs, 
octaves, key signatures, you know, incorrect bar lengths, pickup bars, all this stuff. And what you, if you want to exclude something, just uncheck it, you know, and then and then it's fine. It's not, it's not going to correct or look, give suggestions. So if you click on this line, it says cello, piano dynamic is repeated. Aha. All right, let's see where we are. We are in measure 12 and measure 12 is here and you can see over there it's it's blinking and let's see why yes it's correct because down here i have the piano in the cello and then for some reason i did it again okay here we go that's great so you know this is uh, can be deleted you don't need this one good uh what's next diminuendo is cut short by a pianissimo aha that is interesting Yes. So if you have a melodic phrase and I want this to diminuendo, I should have said, okay, let's go to triple pianissimo and then we pick it up again at pianissimo. This is actually unclear. I find this, this is a good suggestion. As a composer, I need to be more specific where this diminuendo here in the cello, which is also should be starting over here, uh, should be maybe like the viola. Okay, so good, good catch. I like that. Okay, piano staff. A uh, repeated bass clef in bar 30. Okay, here we are. Maybe it was a, something I did. Yeah, I don't really need... Let me see, is there a treble clef? Oh, here. Yeah, so I'm coming from a treble clef up here. And then I added, of course, the, the bass clef for the left hand. And then I, for some reason, I did it again here. Yeah, we don't need that one either. Excellent catch. Okay, good. So and this goes on and on. Dynamic is C piano. Dynamic is quiet at the end after gradual dynamic. So it 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 yeah. Here we also my mistake. It should have gone from a forte to maybe a fortissimo right here, and then to a mezzo forte subito. Uh yes, good good stuff. See, I mean it's actually working. Let's see. Uh, same. It's a lot of dynamic. I see a lot of over sloppy things from my end as a composer. Diminuendo cut short. That's great. I like that. Uh, Portanticello is repeated. See, because maybe I pasted a phrase. Okay. Prescendo happen is cut short. Yeah, so a lot of dynamic things. You know, maybe I, you know, you're not, you need to be more careful. <laughs> I need to be more careful where it's going, what it's doing. And, and of course, I see this in a lot of music, by the way. You know, even the classics, as you know, some of the, a published music Mozart Bach there's hardly anything in it and sometimes there's a crescendo and you just wonder where does it go to are we getting loud super loud medium so it's actually it's something a composer and and a publisher needs to worry about give give uh, detailed instructions impossible finger tremolo let's take a look at that I'm a string player so I wonder what it caught here viola here it is okay so we are having a and a C and an E natural. Yes, so this is actually, you can play this on the viola. You hold down the E on the D string and the open A and you trill with your second finger. So it's definitely playable. But I should have written it differently. I should have written it as two voices, polyphonic mode with the bottom note being separate. Maybe it doesn't look like that. I think the players figured it out when they looked at it. But yeah, Dorico is saying, wait a minute, that that fourth trilling to the second finger is odd. Okay, so this is interesting. Okay, good. Let's go over back here. Uh, we have more dynamics, repeated bass clefs. I repeat a time signature. That stuff also happens. Here it is. Why? Because I have, you know, meter changes and I come from a 2-4 and I'm going to a 3-4 right here. And of course, there's no need to repeat it here. Correct. Get rid of that. So yes, not too many mistakes. And it's mostly repetitions and dynamics. Great. I think that's a, a, it's a good improvement. It's a good thing to have if you don't need to use it. But if it pop, you know, brings something up, I'm going to look at orchestral music in another video to see how it catches, you know, transposition changes or, or anything that might say, hey, clarinet cannot change to bass clarinet in two seconds or things like that. I don't know. Maybe that happens also. So this is nice. One other thing, if you click on the I, you can now turn off the system track, which is the uh, the gray uh, uh, bar numbers, right? So if those bother you, I like them because sometimes I'm working somewhere down here and I wonder where am I if I have a score maybe in front of me in addition. So, But anyway, you can turn off the system track right here. Super simple. 
You can also turn off the signposts if you have any, which is great. Sometimes they get into the way. Uh, you can show tabs if there are any tabs, right? Signposts would be uh, here. See, now they're gone from page. All right, so let's look at the cycle locators, which is brand new, interesting feature. I think uh, great to have it. There are a couple little kinks still about it, and I'll show you why. But uh, if you you know click the button, you're gonna see the cycle locator. You're the last one you set if you set one at all. It's very simple to uh, set the regions. Either you you know drag the handles, you know start and and uh, end points like in any DAW, or you you select let's say. Uh, our group of notes, you go to play, you go to locator, set cycle locators from selection, and then it's it's also done. And you activate it by clicking the uh, cycle button here, which turns it purple. Now it's active. So there's one thing when you play back, you're going to hear those two bars repeated, but visually that green playback cursor is going to jump ahead a little bit. You're going to see what happens here. Maybe they fix it in a, in an update. So it's playing, of course, the end of the loop, but visually it jumps ahead, you know, so I'm not sure. I have to look into the settings if this is something I can fix or if it's just the way this uh, playback works. But the point is you can have a cycle region to improvise to uh, experiments. And in the past, you had to set repeat marks on the end of those bars set the repeat to 50 times or something and then remove everything later without forgetting that you put them there. So I think this is great. Uh, and again, see, this works across the page view. It works uh, in, you know, in the galley view. And uh, you can even go, you know, uh, just maybe in, based on your grid. Ah, come on. You can go in uh, an eighth node earlier, right? So you can set the region where you want it and it might be helpful. I think it's a great feature. So the playback line is still a little bit confusing, a little off, but I'm sure that's going to be fixed in the future. All right, so that, and you can turn off the cycle locators right here. So if we go back to the hub and you click on the new tab, uh, I will take a look at the condensing function, which I find fascinating now. I think it's important. Um, this one allows you to condense actually all instruments held by a player. And as you can see in the example, there's a clarinet player one and two, and, and they're going to switch to A, clarinet and A, which is two different instrument lines in your score. And that can be now all on one staff. That's great. Same with the horns. Here we have the regular horns in F, and then they're switching to horns in D. And again, this can be now uh, all com combined into their respective uh, staff. So that's cool. Also, we have a grid function. You know, so for more detail, look at that. You can really get into the engraving, make this look absolutely perfect if you are publishing house and you're selling these and you want this you know have be really nicely done and there's overrides for flow headings so you can actually change uh, certain uh, titles and things you want which was a little complicated in the previous version and now it looks actually nice if you do this kind of these kind of projects you know so that's cool open type uh, we have, uh, you know, open type features, which is great. You can change that. Um, you can actually, you know, control, let's say, large uh, time signatures. If you do like in, in movie uh, soundtrack recordings, you know, that's how those scores usually look for the conductor to quickly see what's happening. So there's more control. Um, what is the fill view? Uh, it fills your display at flexibly flowing as many systems of music as possible into the width and height of the window. So maybe it's, ma okay, I'm going to do another video on that. I want to see how that changes the layout and the look. That's great. Yeah, we talked about quickly about the cycle payback, which is great. Um, chord symbols. So there's now, see, optional chord extenders. You can actually, something like B Lydian now. That's great. You can do that. And, and uh, change uh, your coding. Also have a second line, that's wonderful. Cutaways, great function for contemporary writing. This is also a, a Q reduction, as you can see. So it only shows the important stuff going on and it cuts away the empty bars. So that's great. Uh, also for school demonstrations, you know, things like that. So amazing. 
And of course, the proofreading we talked about, right, in detail in the last video. So here you have it. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoy Dorico 6. If you already have it, let me know what you think. If it makes your workflow easier, uh, I think uh, good improvements. And uh, I will do a couple more videos coming up. So thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.